Aloha mai kako. Happy Aloha Friday. Welcome to He Hue Viola. My name is Kale Chang. It's my pleasure to be your host. He Hue Viola is a webinar series brought to you by Ahakane and Kanaiokana. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to strengthen our ohana by uplifting and empowering our kane, our Hawaiian men. He Hue Viola means a gourd of living water, referring to a man as a vessel of life guided by the god kane. In Hawaiian culture, gourds also represent knowledge. In this series, we'll be introducing you to some extraordinary people, cultural practitioners, scholars, leaders in our community, and they'll share perspectives, practices, and advocacy in our lahui. Aloha nui to all our viewers. Mahalo nui for joining us today. As we get started here, please shoot us a quick aloha in our Zoom chat box or Facebook comments, and let us know where you're joining us from. Also, if you have comments or want to ask questions throughout the show, uh, please do so, and we'll do our best to include you in our conversation. All right, welcome to a very, very special episode of He Hui Vaiola, Ma'i Ahulau. Today, we take a closer look at the history of epidemics here in Hawaii and how these experiences can help us better understand, give some context, and help us better prepare ourselves for COVID-19 in our households, communities, and even at government leadership levels as well. Let's meet our guests for today. First, she's a haumana of Pauline Chin and Alika Mauna Kea, currently an educator in our DOE system, where she's also been an advocate for the arts. She's developed a very unique program for her students at one point, using old Hawaiian nupepa and stories of Liliuo Kalani to help them get a grasp on what's going on today. Please welcome Kaleolani Hanohano. Thank you for joining us. Next, we have a former executive director of Papa Ololokahi. Last year, he received the Mary Kavena Pukui Award for his efforts and dedication to preserving our Hawaiian culture and language. He's also an author, co-author of over 100 publications and numerous educational tools and material. Now retired, he enjoys his time in the ocean, philanthropy, Hawaiian history, and of course, continuing to be of service to others. Please welcome Hardy Spore. Thank you for joining us. Next, we have our good friend Joanne. She has over three decades of public health uh, experience focusing on reducing health disparities among Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. For 18 years, she's been the research director at Papa Ololokahi and a project director of Imi Hale Native Hawaiian Cancer Network. As a public health educator, her work has focused uh, prioritizing community participation and capacity building to help identify community strengths and also to address social uh, determinants of health. Please welcome Joanne Sark. Aloha. And finally, her ohana has roots in both Waimanalo and Papakolea. Her father was Hawaii's first science curriculum specialist as a former science teacher and now professor of sustainability science education. She follows in the footsteps of her family whose lives have been shaped by Hawaii's tumultuous history. Please welcome Pauline Chin. These are our four panelists. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Aloha mai kako. All right. So, He Hui Viola is on our 16th week, and we have provided. Um, an opportunity for distraction, an opportunity for family time, for our ohana and our community out there. Um, but today, instead of avoiding the crisis at hand, we are taking it head on and we we're going to discuss it with uh, four very important people who are on our panel today. As of yesterday, August 20th, 2020, Hawaii has 236 new COVID-19 cases, which brings our total to 5,844 cases, sadly with 45 deaths. Some would say these are unprecedented times, and in many ways that's true, but culturally and historically speaking, this is by no means our first health crisis uh, our islands have experienced. Um, before we get into all the wonderful things that each of you are involved in, I'd really like to just, for context again, to, to speak about the history of epidemics here in Hawaii. I'm going to bullet point a few things, and I'm going to open the conversation for, for each of you, for all four of you. Um, in 18... Okay, so up until 
1778, there was pretty much no disease or illnesses present in Hawaii. In 1804 was our first epidemic, uh, probably uh, cholera, which um, affected 15,000 of our population. In 1820, our Hawaiian population was 150,000. Uh, 1824, we had an epidemic of cough, which killed thousands. 1832, whooping cough. 1839, mumps. 1840, first case of leprosy. Uh, 1853, first smallpox. 1870, scarlet fever. And there's a few more to list from then till to the present time. But as you can see already, uh, for all of our viewers out there, COVID-19 is definitely not our first health crisis in the islands. And all of these health crises that we've had uh, uh, pre-statehood, we had much less resources, much less ability to communicate with one another. And our leadership, our, our ali'i, our royalty of Hawaii, and our, our leaders in the, in the community, um, we, we made it, you know, we, we've made it up until now, and we are looking to the past to help us better deal with what we're dealing with today. Um, so first question for our panelists, are there any things in particular in our uh, epidemic history that you'd like to, to make a point about or, or discuss for a moment? Just to give us a better context of uh, what we've been through in the past. Well, I, I'll certainly jump into the ring. Um, All right, thank you. Um, maybe, uh, you know, I have a real short um, PowerPoint with just a couple of charts that, and that Thanks. sort of sets the tone. So let me just share this with you folks. Uh -huh. Let's see if it works. Screen, share. And what happened? You are sharing screen. Oh, you know what? I'm going to I'll come back to this. Let me go back to where everybody is. I'm sorry. I screwed okay. up because I don't have it ready yet. I got to get to that first. But let me just say, um, it's, it's not a gloom and doom situation right now. Um, I, I'm, I was asked to talk about the uh, Spanish, so-called Spanish flu. It was an influenza yes. that was a pandemic uh, that swept through Hawaii two or three times uh, and had a tremendous impact on all of us here. Um, we've forgotten that. Uh, over 2,300 people passed away because of it. Uh, between 3 and 5% of the world's population died because of it. Uh, and it indeed created and changed history. Um, with, uh, when I get to this little <laughs> PowerPoint, I, I just want to show that uh, we uh, can deal with it. We've done it before. And I think that's the message I just want to convey, that um, this uh, era that we're going through, this sad time that we're going through, uh, is not new. And we have always risen as island people to the challenge. So that's all I really want to say. And I'll get the PowerPoint ready. <laughs> OK, I mean, anybody else want to, want to speak about things that have happened in our history? Hi, this is Joanne. Hi, um, Joanne. Hi, you know, I, I did my best to um, convince uh, Dr. Ben Young to be part of this panel because he is quite the authority on on historical uh, medical in fact. But I did have a chance to talk to him. And, you know, as Hardy said, this is not new. We've been around this uh, block a lot. Um, but one of the things that, you know, Dr. Young and I discussed was that the things that needed to be done was really came from our leadership. It came from our ali'i. And he cited some good examples of that. One was Kina'u, you know, Kuhina Nui at the time, who then required that all ships coming into the port had to be um, inspected by medical personnel. Her analysis was that when ships came in, we got sick. So it was a no-brainer, but that was 
he said probably one of the first public health measures that Ali'i passed down. And, you know, we have other examples of it. I think people are going to be so excited to hear from Pauline and, and Kaleo about what they're doing with our Hawaiian history and how they're incorporating it into current education. But yes, I think definitely leadership. And of course, we all remember Kalau Papa and how the epidemic uh, with the leprosy and the quarantine. And while those are sad and really drastic measures, you know, Ben said they worked. You know, we don't want to get to that point with this. And, you know, so as a health educator, I always worry when I see complacency about not doing what we know we're supposed to be doing, uh, feeling a little bit invincible because it hasn't touched us personally yet. But um, we don't want to do drastic measures, but sometimes that's what it will take. Um, so um, I just wanted to make sure Ben got his little points in because uh, it was, um, <laughs> well, and the other thing for people to remember with Kalau Papa, that one of the reasons people were isolated was because of tourism. And even though it wasn't the extent to what it was today, you know, people didn't like having that visual reminder of this disease going on in Hawaii at the time. Thanks. I wanted Thank to share my that, screen. Joanne. Is it okay yes, for you to share my screen? Okay. Yes, please do. All right. So, aloha mai kako. Aloha. So a couple of the things that I wanted to bring into the space first is um, our ability to approach this to, um, through the lens of a kumo or a teacher today. So really important if we're looking at leadership, uh, going back to our, our uh, kupuna knowledge. And one of the real fine factors is how do you have kiki understand when we as adults are talking about leaders? What is a leader? What kind of leaders are we wanting to create? And so I heard that word brought up and and um, really important for kids to understand that what is a ko'o, um, why is the might a tree? Um, so first of all, what do you see in the picture? You know, what do you think and what do you wonder? It's a hard question today we're asking um, each other is what was different, what was done differently in the past? And in order for our kids to do the same kind of analysis, they have to really have this uh, equipment with them, these tools. So one of the things I go through with them is kilo aha, is, you know, what is it? Where is it? Why is it the purpose of it? And then, of course, taking them to the next step, which is to look at the essential question of today, um, what we're talking about. And I'll come back to this, but I wanted to share this. We talked about all of those uh, disparities, but did we really teach the kids about what we did look like population-wise? We were healthy. Look at how amazingly healthy we were, you know? Right. And so that's a really great way to start the conversation I heard us talking about. We made it through it and uh, we were successful. But I think this is one of the key points is that when we, re when we wanna have kids analyze um, this discussion, it's good for them to see what our population really looked like. And so that's what I want to bring into the space uh, with that question, Carl, is, you know, where were we? What did we look like? How many of us were mm. there? How healthy did we look like? Mahalo, Kaleo. That's a great stat to, to, to look at. Awesome. Getting back to Joanne's point about our, our leadership back in the day. Um, yeah, when, when Kina'u uh, implemented that, that first public health measure of screening the foreign vessels that was 1836 so all our viewers are there 200 years ago we already had things that were developing to help our hawaiian people also in 1839 kamehameha iii implemented the first quarantine law this is again oh you know almost 200 years ago it's amazing um i know we're we're filled with stats that we can share but it'd be wonderful to hear some stories as well um pauline could you Tell us, you shared the other day a wonderful story about how Lili'u um, did some certain things to protect outer islands and keep disease from spreading. Um, I thought that was a very wonderful story. You mind sharing a little bit of that? Sure, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. It's really an honor. I'm going to show the screen. And this is the curriculum that we developed. 
And I have to give uh, all credit to our late night endeavors. You'll see that the authors, Kaleo is an author, uh, uh, Allison uh, Kalino Kaimana is an author. These are two, two teachers and they're, in, they're really leadership. The next two are Hawaiian translators in my NSF program. And then there's myself. So together we constructed this, but it began with a uh, conversation at 1 p.m., 1 a.m. rather, about leadership. And it just so happened that it had crossed my uh, email about the story about Lili'u when she shut down the ports of Honolulu in 1881. And as a princess, she did this because um, the king was away. So the stories there began to look at from uh, the purpose of uh, Kaleo's class was to look at what does it mean to be a leader? What does it mean to take those chances? And from there, you can see that we have actually generated a whole curriculum. Uh, we looked at the history. We have a, a number of resources. We bring it into the present, and we begin to, to look at leadership, not only from the perspective of the past, but into the present. And because we are uh, all STEM teachers, we also look at issues of how does it work? How does, how does the virus, why is it so contagious? And because we're at the point where, where we're on lockdown and most of us are doing this um, virtually, the lessons are actually designed to be taught online. We also want to look at the impact of uh, culture and cultural values. And so at the very end is a lesson on the six Tongan teenagers who were shipwrecked on an island that was Kapu. So they weren't found for 15 months. And in that 15 months, they basically uh, recreated a sustainable society, a resilient society in which they remembered from their elders teachings where to find water from plants that they didn't have, they never had to rely upon, how to plant, how to make fire, and how to deal with um, fights. And these were six teenagers who had stolen a boat because they were bored with school and wanted to, wanted to sail to Fiji. So these are the narratives of resilience and the narratives of the different kinds of knowledge that help people to situate themselves where they are in this moment, but to draw upon their cultural strengths to be able to make it from this day into the future um, positively and together. And I will share this curriculum uh, with everyone. Uh, it's quite long, as you can see, but it has this, uh, the impact on the wow. economy. It has uh, historical, it has science. It says, how do viruses transfer from animals to humans, uh, and this particular one is thought to have started in uh, uh, bats, and then it goes into the current issues of uh, how fast it's reproducing. Com and right now, Hawaii, uh, it's called RT, it's that transmission. We are, uh, when I last looked at the, the graph, we were the highest in the nation. In other words, every person who is um, infected will infect 1.4 others. So it's not under control and it's gonna to continue to spread. And later on, we'll talk about um, how schools can help uh, perhaps in this public health struggle, but being stronger together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Hardy, did you have your slides ready? Are you okay? Yes, I think so. But actually, you know, almost everything that I had planned has been talked about. But I'll, I'll throw it on here uh, just so we have it. Um, okay.
Okay, can Just you see give that? To all of our viewers, thank you for joining us. Our viewers from all. Can, can everyone see place. this? Um, can we see anything yet? No, not yet. Okay. Um, I wonder if I need to go back. Uh, go ahead. Well, go I mean, ahead. I'll get my okay. granddaughter. <laughs> okay. Well, even if we can't see it, you can still share whatever information you'd like to share. That's fine. Yeah. Well, here. Um, Kee. <laughs> hey. sorry. Come, I need your help. <laughs> okay, I need to get this PowerPoint on. It, thanks for the younger generation. This is a good example of why you don't want old people like me. Wait, did you open your PowerPoint? Okay, my PowerPoint is here. So okay, I open opened it. Okay. Can I go back to Zoom? Go back to Zoom. Okay. <laughs> no, the other one. Click, click that, and then click that one. And then click share. Share. Okay, now um, go back to your. Ah, uh, yes, we see it. You see it. Click on the yes. Uh, Where? Great. Over here. No, your PowerPoint. You can Just click, click it, it on. Yep, and then you can start it. Oh, okay. Can everybody see that? Yep. Yes. Oh, amazing. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. You, Come on, my folks. Hey. Um, okay. Well, I think we all know that. Uh, a thousand years went by, and uh, the the uh, the the various therapeutics of of Hawaiian health uh, handled very well the issues of the local population, uh, and it was only when foreign people started to arrive that there were issues. And over here, we've got the first physician who actually the European physician who visited the islands, uh, Samuel. Uh, he was a Welshman, and he was the surgeon on board Captain Cook's ship. And he did actually give a, um, a description of the Hawaiian people being very healthy and well. Um, and actually, he's noted for giving that first description. Um, and sometime between that and 1820, when the first American-trained physician came, Dr. Thomas Holman, with his wife uh, and <clears throat> returning with the four uh, Hawaiian students from Cornwall, great changes had occurred in the population. So <clears throat> uh, in terms of what actually had gone on, that's still being studied. Um, we've got, of course, the whole litany of different epidemics that hit the islands and the island population, particularly the native Hawaiian population strongly because of uh, the, the issue around um, immunity. Um, but you'll see as you look down the list here, uh, which has already been, been noted, um, a whole litany of, of issues, all Western introduced issues that the La'au and the medical folk, at, uh, the traditional folks, really had a hard time uh, treating because, of course, these were all foreign, uh, foreign diseases. And this has already been discussed and noted. Um, the first effort to try to address these new issues was to quarantine. And the first uh, person was the Kuhina Nui for Kawikeo Uli, Kamehameha III. Kinau, who issued this um, declaration to the pilot in Honolulu to basically quarantine any ship that had aboard any um, semblance of smallpox. And if there were, that uh, he was not to go aboard and for the ship to uh, be directed to a spot in the harbor or offshore and fly a yellow flag, which is really interesting, I think. Um, and then this has already been discussed uh, also um, in Hawaii's story. Uh, by the queen. She notes uh, that uh, the king had just left, and in 1881, she is suddenly faced with uh, an introduction of smallpox. Uh, and she summons the cabinet, and it's interesting what she does. Um, and actually, it's interesting what the, uh, the people do as well. And this will sound a bit familiar. Um, this appeared in the 
Kuokoa, the Hawaiian language uh, newspaper, about a lady who, uh, a mom and uh, her daughter, the daughter was suffering from smallpox. And what did they try to do? They tried to outrun the quarantine and go out into the country. Of course, they get caught uh, and they're returned uh, to Ka'ulana. Um, that's Moko Island, uh, Moko uh, Ea Island today. Um, the mother was quarantined and of course uh, they appeared before the judge, Richard uh, Bickerton. So <clears throat> what did the region do? Well, with the help of the Board of Health, uh, at that time, uh, Samuel Wilder and her husband, um, John Dominus, who was the governor, she shut down the port. All commerce was stopped and all food uh, purchases, uh, except for purchases and gatherings, quarantined all who were on the ship. She prohibited all travel between the neighbor islands. She set up a place for the sick to be separated from the healthy. So she, asked, she asked the citizens to keep the cleanliness and warned against large gatherings of Honolulu residents. Um, today, we only need to add the prescription about wearing protective masks. Uh, and we've got the formula. The queen knew the formula. Um, and jumping now to the 18, uh, 1918, uh, the 1920 epidemic, just basically the facts, um, it's interesting to note that this was influenza. It was not the coronavirus. It was a separate type of virus. Influenza virus and the coronavirus are two separate viruses. Um, but <clears throat> the impacts were very similar. And we've already mentioned that uh, over 50 million people passed away because of it. Um, what was done? Well, public gatherings here in, in Hawaii, what was done? The first wave uh, was identified in the U.S. continent in March 1918 and on Oahu in June. So three months it took for the virus to, to get here. And the first uh, semblance of the virus was seen at soldiers at Schofield Bar Barracks in Pearl Harbor. Um, what was done? Well, again, uh, large gatherings were prohibited, uh, large public gatherings, children keeping away from children. Now here, this is the first instance I saw of a requirement to wear a gauze mask. Keep the hands clean. Don't shake hands, salute or bow. So again, six feet. And this happened at a very troubling time. And this is why this particular virus was also very um, impactful. Um, prohibition had just gone into effect here. Uh, and there was still a feeling that alcohol uh, was thought to have a positive effect, a healthful effect. So the uh, distributors of alcohol did not necessarily shut down. They continued to uh, serve alcohol, and in fact, some people took it to the extreme, and that just uh, uh, in, in, uh, increased the uh, impact. Uh, many physicians at the time in Hawaii were also serving in Europe in World War I, so there was a real dearth of physicians here in the islands. And of course, uh, in 1920, um, the Great Sugar Strike occurred, and that brought uh, many laborers from the neighbor islands here to Honolulu, uh, which uh, just created a hotbed for the virus. Um, the death rates from that 1918 to 1920 uh, uh, influenza, you'll see that it really impacted the 20 to 39 year old resident population the greatest. Um, whether you look in all three years that it, it actually uh, appeared here. And if you look at the um, population, it shows that the Caucasian population was um, most heavily impacted, well, actually the Japanese population, but just a couple of notes, the Caucasian population included the military. Um, the Japanese population was primarily the laborers on the uh, plantations. And so again, because of the closeness of family ties and um, the fact that they were pretty much um, uh, very close to one another, the uh, disease uh, passed very quickly from individual to individual. Um, in terms of the, the age distribution, uh, if you look at the age distribution, again, 
the highest impacted age distribution was under five years old, which again, uh, infants uh, really suffered under this. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of people that we all know, or at least we know one will be recognizable, Duke Hanamoku. Duke contracted this virus. Um, he was in Washington, D.C. at the time on a tour. Um, he actually was raising money for the Red Cross. And as part of that, he uh, went around doing swimming exhibitions and would knit. He was a wonderful knitter. Uh, and he would knit scarves and caps and they would sell them at his, uh, at his I guess you could call them swimming exhibitions. Um, he was in the hospital for almost three weeks and he dropped from uh, 100, well, uh, about 200 pounds down to 175. Uh, and he returned home immediately after getting out of the hospital. And one of the interesting quotes that uh, he did made when he stepped off the ship was, oh, I'm back to my homeland, you know? And he, at that point, um, was a, got back to the beach and regained his strength. The other person nobody really knows about, I don't think, uh, Joanne will recognize the name. Um, his auntie was Princess Kaiulani. Uh, he was the son of, um, uh, how to explain this relationship? He was the son of a woman who actually also was the wife of Cleghorn, uh, Archibald Cleghorn. And so he had a distinct royal tie. Um, but he left the islands very, uh, very early in his education and went to California. He's well known uh, actually in lifeguard circles in California and pretty much introduced lifeguarding as we know it, professional lifeguarding in California, uh, George Freeth. Um, there is a uh, bust of his, uh, Santa Monica Pier, uh, just as if you go to uh, uh, some of the other places, the three young P.E. Coy brothers have uh, recognition for introducing surfing. George Freeth uh, has a reputation of developing the lifeguarding uh, structure that continues today for the LA County uh, up and down the California coast. So, um, and sadly, he passed away. He was ill for about three months and then passed away. Just a final note, because oftentimes we don't know what COVID-19 means. Um, and I, I thought it would be interesting just for people to realize what, and what that abbreviation stands for. Uh, the C stands for coronavirus. It's that type of a virus. Um, the VI, of course, for virus and the D for disease. <clears throat> and the 19 for the year that it was identified, of course, in China. So that's what I was going to introduce my comments with. And most of you have already talked about those things. So at any rate, I thank you for your forbearance. And uh, uh, that's it. No, mahalo. Thank you for, for sharing that very thorough kind of bullet point of our history. Okay. Um, and like I said, it's, it's, that's the importance of today is not, not to give our viewers comfort, but to give them context that we've been through this before and we'll make it through this, you know, through COVID-19 as well. So I really appreciate um, that presentation right there. Um, at this time, we're going to take a quick little commercial break. Kanani, if we can prep that, uh, we have a video from our dear friend, Mehana Hind, who's um, in charge of community outreach at OHA. And her, along with a lot of the kumuhula in our Hawaiian community, have started a new movement called Lahui Kanaka, where their focus is mauliola, or the well-being of our community. Uh, take a look at this video. Aloha, my name is Mihana Okala Hind, and I come before you today as a kumuhula. You know, we are all going through the same struggle here in Hawaii with COVID-19. I want to introduce to all of you a culturally responsive way that over two dozen kumuhula have committed through. Kumuhula from throughout the Pai'aina Hawaii have committed to Alahui Kanaka a way of dealing with this in which we take the best practices of hula 
and let it become our guiding force in helping our halal, our ohana, and our communities survive through this epidemic. For three anahulu, or three 10-day periods, we have committed that we will share with our ohana and with our halal, mauliola or those practices, those ideas, and that knowledge system which encourages the health and well-being of our people. Please join us. Join us in this effort to help flatten the curve. We can no longer rely on anyone else to help us to get through this. Let us look to our Hawaiian culture, let us look to our cultural practices, and let us as Kumu Hula and Hula people help everyone else navigate through these challenging times. For more information, email lahuikanaka at gmail.com. Mahalo, aloha, and keep yourself safe. Yes, mahalo nui to my sister, Mehana Hind, and all of our dear friends, Akumuhula of Hawaii Ne for you know you want something done right you do it yourself so they our leaders in our community stepped up to to directly speak to our lahui and encourage them to do what needs to be done for the health and safety of our people so mahalo to oha um, mehana and lahui kanaka wonderful okay so we've established basically the the, the bullet points of our history of epidemics and, and illness and disease that affected our Hawaiian people uh, throughout history. Now, um, let's start talking about where we're going. What, what's the future of our people? And all of you have such um, wonderful histories of working in our community here in Hawaii. Um, I would love for you to, as, as we get into these things, um, if you can tell us a little bit about yourselves, what, what led you to do uh, what you're currently doing. I'd like to go back to Kumu Kaleo, if we could. And um, I know that program stopped, but you did a wonderful program at a DOE school where you took what, you, what we've learned as a lahui in the past and incorporated it into something very special for your kids. Could you tell us just a little bit about yourself and then what happened in that program? Okay, I'm going to just share my uh, screen, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Where did it go? Sorry, everybody. No, no problem. Oh. Sharing the wrong thing. I don't know what happened. Hold on, everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll definitely um, want to just talk with everybody while I'm getting that together. Aloha mai kako. In March, it was really an uh, interesting time for us as a school and a community where our, our challenges at the time were to close up and make ready for our spring break. And right before we did that, what really dawned on me was the, the, the lack of introduction to this um, coronavirus. It was coming our way. Everybody knew it was coming. Everybody knew it had already hit. And yet, we received nothing, right? And here we are, the educators, making sure that we prepare for our haumana and they're going out on spring break. So I approached my principal and um, prior to that, met up with Pauline and she threw out a bunch of emails and I opened one up. And it was, what was really uh, amazing is to read about our, our, our princess of the time, Lili Uokalani, and to find out at that period of time how important it is for us to um, visit the new Pepa, Olelo Hawaii. And so I decided um, that evening that I would take a look at it, create some curriculum behind it, and then shoot it over back to her. And when doing that, I realized um, I had to also roll out to my principal. So I actually did that. And you know, some teachers don't have that ability. I just want to let everyone know. They don't have that relationship with their principal. They don't have the relationship. Uh, they have to go up a ladder of some sort. So I was really lucky to have a really close Kilina with my principal. And he said, 
less than an hour of looking at it, go for it. Let's go ahead and do it. And so um, in that process, I decided that, um, and I'm going to share my screen now that I found it. In that process, I felt that the kids needed to know what coronavirus was. They didn't know. So um, what's important for us right now is that a lot of kids don't know. Uh, their families don't know. And unless teachers roll that out to them in this next uh, couple of days for school, they won't know. And that's where um, I felt really empowered, that I wanted to empower my haumana. And so in doing so, I approached it through two different lens. One was if I had lived during that period of time. I asked the kids, if you lived during that period of time, what would your ohana look like? How would this have impact? This would have made an impact on your families. And then go look at stories in your families. What is the mo'olelo that might link you to this period or this time? And you know what was so heartbreaking for my haumana, especially those that are of native Hawaiian ancestry? My family does not know. They don't know. And that made me realize that the impact of this was the loss of even our mo'olelo. The mo'oku auhau of our communities. It's not that every year I ask the haumana, please tell me your mo'olelo. Please write for me or make for me your mo'oku auhau. You know now, with this coronavirus, I've realized they don't know because the kupuna probably no longer. I live in Laie and I look up above me on the hillsides where there should be kalo farms for days reaching all the way up to the heights. What happened to those Kalo farmers? Where are those families? And this also dawned on my students to even dig deeper and wider and even spread their wings into other places like the Kumu Kanavai that Kama, Kamakau speaks about. The lesson also made us look into broader aspects like, okay, if I'm sitting next to four or five people and they have the coronavirus, maybe even one person. How was it for our Kanaka during this time? Contact tracing, you know, how close did they get to each other? What did that really look like? How did they um, have comfort in their families? And ancient um, knowledge also protocols, protected life ways far into the future, meant a deepening of our ahupua'a, this ahupua'a system which was built upon Kumu Kanavai. And so a set of laws created by the Ali'i um, and Kamakau talks about it deeply, but he also says this, that these laws were created and strictly managed and maintained. Some laws carried the names of Ali'i themselves in it, so it made it even stronger. And so these ancestors lived in a, in a sense of kapu all the time. So, you know, as our leaders start to open or close or put us in quarantine, we have native Kanaka. We know about kapu. We've lived with kapu. We understand kapu not to mean forbidden, but it also means to be in ceremony. Dr. Pualani Kanaka Ole, she shares earlier that the meaning of kapu is prohibited and sacred. She goes on to say that it is a place or space that demands reverence and focused intention. That the idea of how we behave not only to self, but to people around us. When growing up with the use of kapu in the, uh, the vocabulary of the home, I often wondered why people saw the term as being negative or bad, right? Western fun functionality uses kapu as meaning keep out or referring to privatization of land and land ownership and misuse of terms. This mis misuse of our terms confuse and even bring almost a level of ignorance. What was really interesting for me is that Antipua case expresses kapu to mean how you conduct yourself in a ceremony. So today, when we look at COVID-19, and when I talk to my students and I actually enlist the qualities of our kupuna every day when they come into my class, I ask them these really basic questions. What is the definition? You know, what do you know about this? And then what does the kupuna say about it? And I think, this is just me, I really believe that these are steps and these are little tiny trails that our kupuna have left to us so that we can get through coronavirus in ceremony. 
for instance, when we say kapu for uh, the, the moi is, is, is in its kapu season, or it's time that we do not eat more because it's kapu, Auntie Pua would say, it's their season. They're in ceremony. We cannot eat them because maybe they're spawning right now, right? We understand it to be that way. And so this lesson that I did launch with the help of um, my, my professor, Dr. Pauline Chen, and my principal, not only insist in, gave the students the skills that they needed when they were out during the break, but can you imagine what it did for them when the message came that schools were closed and we weren't opening? Right now, we are not opening. And still, my students tell me, Kumu, thank you for teaching us how to wear a mask. Kumu, thank you for telling us that I have to go home and wash my hands. Kumu, thank you so much. My mom and my dad are now talking to me about my ohana bubble. These are the kind of conversations I get on Instagram and Facebook. So I hope that was helpful in answering your question, Colin. Thank you so much for sharing the great works that you're doing for, for Keiki. Um, Pauline, do you mind continuing this train of thought on how important uh, education is in dealing with the health crisis like we are right now? First, I want to thank Kaleo because Kaleo, um, it, it is these conversations that lead to the development of new knowledge structures. And I look yes. at what Kaleo has done in her ability to move a group of students that shares that knowledge then with the community so that the whole community is uplifted. So this became the heart and the kernel and the driving force of the curriculum I talked about. Let me share my screen with some of the um, information that we share with students. We ask them now, after they have thought about the respect for the elders, to connect, to connect that to an understanding of who is vulnerable. And so here you see this uh, COVID-19 dashboard that is updated every day. I want people to understand within our own communities that certain members are more vulnerable, but if they are vulnerable, we are all vulnerable. A group of us, Alika and Ruben, put together um, an NIH proposal. We don't know if it's going to be funded. But even without that funding, there are so many things that we can do that Kaleo has talked about, uh, that, we, that when we go into the past and we think about this sacred space and how we need to behave, we can actually operationalize uh, and I'm sorry, I'm a STEM person, so I, I use words like that, um, <laughs> where you can actually take these the kind of uh, statements about the six feet and then turn it into a science plan so that the students, and I'll give you an example, certain groups, and you can see that this would be Pacific Islanders, where they're only 4% of the population, but 31% of the caseload. Um, again, here's another example where the Filipino population is overrepresented in terms of the cases. So wherever you see your green line higher than your gray line, and you see them outside these two bars, whoops, I, okay, there it goes. Then you know that these are the groups that are the most vulnerable. So we teach so that students understand why you need the six feet. We actually have the lessons in here that teach why it's safer to be outdoors. That if you are meeting with your students, why you, you turn off your AC if you're lucky enough to have AC, but open your windows and your doors. And we can have them do the math because we know we want to be bringing in the, the mathematics and the science. And we can have them, even if they don't have anemometers, looking outdoors and seeing how the wind is blowing by how the leaves are rustling, how the twigs are moving, how the grass is moving, and then estimate the wind flow. And using that knowledge and then measuring the, the size of the classroom, you can actually calculate if you're outdoors versus indoors, 
how fast your air is turning over. So what we want to do then is enable the students to go home and actually do an assessment of where they live with their ohana. We want them to know what are the indicators of COVID so they can talk to their, their ohana. And, and through this trusting relationship, a knowledge-based but trusting relationship, be able to do an assessment as if in a way they are community health workers using the language that the family speaks, respecting the relationships within the family, but being able to say, gee, grandma, maybe we should try to um, open the windows. I know you might feel a little bit cold in the draft, but it's really important that there be some flow through of air. And to be able to say, gee, maybe we should, um, instead of all eating together in this small space, if we have a lanai, we go outside and we try to assemble um, more in, a, in an area where there is ventilation. Also by knowing how to measure and do the, the space in their, um, in their house, then you can do this by pacing and, and doing an estimation. They can also be able to come back to the teachers and say, oh my goodness, my family has way too many people for the spaces that are supposed to be. If you're looking at a 36 square feet per person, looking at a six foot on each side, yeah? So actually that's more because if it's six feet on each side, that's 12. And then when you grid that out, many people are going to have too many people for the space they're living in. So as a community health worker, being able to communicate what we would hope. And, and so let me show the age structure too. Then they can say, oh my goodness, for people who are 60 years old, and, and these are the folks that live in multi-generational housing um, or houses. My grandmother, my aunties, my, and my teachers my elders that, whom I respect so much are really, really vulnerable. Oh my goodness, it's the young people that have so many of the cases that might be able to be spreading it, but we don't get so sick, so we don't know, so we just go and we need to be respectful in how we, we are with everyone because we may be those that carry it without the symptoms. And so we teach about asymptomatic too. So we talk about how the different lab tests, and show another of these um, here. So we can show the students and they begin to understand that now the rates are higher, but they also know that more people are, are sick, but more people are not showing it, but they're spreading it like crazy. And then because it's in the blue, this is community spread. We are the ones, whereas this, orange line that is uh, the travel. Okay, I might be in the wrong one. Okay, so positive count, negative count, um, but definitely the positive is going higher over time. And then they can also see where we um, started opening up right here. Okay, this is the one that is uh, interesting this is the epidemic curve. This one even more clearly shows what happened at the beginning when we didn't really understand what was going on. And the blue is travel and travel associated. The red is community spread. So initially you can see a lot of it was brought in from outside, but early on there was already community spread. It was already here. But the behavioral controls, brought it all almost down to zero. Then we began to open up right around here. And then people can begin to see that travel is kind of down, but the community spread is going up. And here you see in the gray that what happens when the cases are so high that the contact tracers cannot, and, and the testing takes so long 
that the contact tracers are not able to readily identify the sources of the contagion. So if people begin to understand that a lot of this can be done by, as, as uh, Kaleo is talking about, respecting your elders and knowing what must be done before any kind of vaccine comes in, we can begin to empower especially the students who come from those uh, vulnerable communities to provide uh, knowledge to the community and then to return it back to the teachers and say, I think we have a problem. I think my grandma is sick, but we don't have health insurance. What do we do? So this is the kind of piece where what is missing from this equation or from this uh, very positive um, thing that the educators can do is the public health connection. So what we're proposing, uh, and this is in our NIH proposal, but I think we can do it already, is if every school had a designated public health contact and that teachers were prepared as uh, outreach for COVID and they also were prepared to do the things that we need, that we know are important, like um, confidentiality, et cetera. If we could do this, we would be able to, at, I think, especially places where you have high numbers. We already know KPT, Kuhio Park Terrace had clusters. We know that those kids go to Farrington. Um, we know that in Waipahu, there, was, there were clusters. Waipahu, I'm going to give a shout out to Waipahu High School, and that's Jeremiah Brown, who is the ESL coordinator. They have uh, students who have already uh, developed educational technology guides in Marshallese, Samoan, Ilocano, um, Tagalog. And it would be really easy to develop um, in Chukis. We don't have one yet, but we have Chukis educators and we have Chukis students. Another shout out to uh, Waipahu. They also have a community health worker program in collaboration with Kapiolani Community College. Many of the students that are in this uh, community health worker program are the same students from the communities of immigrants who don't speak the, the, the language. So again, if you bring together the resources that are within the schools, ESL programs, community health programs, and connect it to a, uh, let's say a department of health um, so that we know that the program, the teaching is going to link up to something where a, a, a student can say, we need help, that student can actually, through the teacher, through the school, wind up getting some action. Um, they're beginning to do what are, what are called SWAT teams. And so if we think about how the role of schools and community health can put out the brush fires, then perhaps the behavior plus what we know about medical can help with these. Um, and I'm going to go back again to uh, the most vulnerable. Let's see. I get the, those who are older. And then it's behind this. I got to move this thing. Our communities who are at risk. And so if you have these bars that are apart from each other, so like looking at the, whoops, looking at the Pacific Islanders, that means statistically significant, they are way, 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 uh, statistically significantly way over rep represented. The closer the bars are, the less you can, you see the difference between the number of people in the population of that category and the incidence of COVID. So you can really clearly see 
who is most at risk and where to target your outreach. Um, and one more shout out to the College of Education. Um, my colleagues, uh, that's Patricia Haligao and um, uh, Good Grief, Chapman. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on her name. I remember Chapman D'Souza and her first name will come in back to me. Do the uh, ESL programs and they are willing to train their cohorts, and so, and so in fact is uh, uh, Jeremiah Brown at Waipahu, to begin to train their their students so that it is purposeful training. It is not training just to be able to have a product that may be used, but a product that may be used for a purpose. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, but you can kind of see that the network of knowledge and the network of basically K through through 20 can be brought to the service of a public health crisis if we know how to take that last gear and connect public health to the schools. Mahalo Nui for sharing those statistics with us, Pauline. These are excellent examples of how we can use the resilient, resiliency factors of our survival in Hawaiian history and other pertinent information and transform them into educational tools for all ages. I'm also glad you kind of mentioned, we've been speaking about our Hawaiian community so much. You also kind of branched out into uh, other ethnicities as well. I'd like to turn the time over a little bit uh, f for a little while to Joanne as, um, if you can speak a little bit about the effect on Pacific Islanders, and I understand you have something you'd like to share uh, for that. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And and um, Patricia and Kaleo, wow, awesome what you guys are doing. I think um, if I had a wish, you should be funded by our state so that curriculum is shared everywhere because you are right, the lack of public health information is staggering of what's not there. But I also want to thank Ahakane and, and Kale about letting me address um, Pacific Islanders. And in specific, I'm talking to the non-Hawaiian Pacific Islanders uh, that are in our state. And because as, uh, and I'm so glad that um, Pauline put up the chart I was trying to get onto my Zoom. Uh, they clearly are at risk and um, at least for the data that we have, have the biggest burden right now. So thank you, thank you for sharing this agenda with that because I think, and then I think the other thing um, I was asked is how do we as Hawaiians support this? And thank you, Pauline. Um, how do we support this and what can we lend to what's happening with Pacific Islanders? So first of all, as the chart clearly shows, 31% of cases, it's almost a third of cases for a population that makes up only 4% of our state population. Now I wanna point out one thing about this data and that is that Pacific Islanders are a big group. So we don't know in that tall green um, bar who are Marshallese, who are Chukis, who are Samoan, who are Tongan. We don't know that because our data is not provided for us and early on, you know, one of the things that first flagged me in Hawaii was getting emails from colleagues in California who said, Joanne, we're seeing really staggering and disturbing statistics in California, Washington, Utah. And we think the numbers are wrong. So we're checking them. And this was back in late February, early March. And they were showing um, rates that were seven times higher for Pacific Islanders on the West Coast. And they said, what's going on in Hawaii? And I couldn't answer because at that time, we didn't have the data. And, um, and unfortunately, we took a step backwards by looking at API data, Asian Pacific Islander data as a group, which historically, and Hardy's the champion of this, uh, masks a lot of the issues and health problems uh, with Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. So even though 
party and folks like Esther Kia Aina out of Senator Akaka's office at the time, uh, after seven years were successful in disaggregating or separating these groups out so that the feds or the federal government could ha get a clearer picture of the issues in Native Hawaiians and separate from Asian Americans. You know, and that was back in 1997. And still, it's very disturbing when we still see data that comes out as AAPI. And the first thing I do when that happens is I send it to Hardy. And the first thing Hardy does is he drafts a letter to the federal agency or office saying, this is not acceptable. And we have changed the guidelines through Office of Management and Budget, budget OMB. So anyway, I just want to let you know that these data are limited for Pacific Island, that it just tells a group story. But we do know that for our Micronesian population, those coming from the Marshall Islands, from Federated States of Micronesia, that they are bearing a big burden. We hear it from our community health centers. We're hearing it anecdotally um, from those who are providing support for food and, and, and housing. So just, just do know that um, the data is a, is a big picture for Pacific Islanders. But why are they impacted more? And I can give you some insights that I, I know or, or learned, and, but not all. Um, and that is, um, if you haven't recently seen the article by Anita Hofschneider, uh, who is part Chamorro, um, in the Civil Beat, she gives a nice accounting of um, Pacific Islanders. And basically, she sums it up pretty succinctly, is that part of the thing that puts this group at higher risk is they are in multifamily households. They are in service industry jobs. You know, they live in large families. They um, have a lot of comorbidities or pre-existing medical conditions, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, which of course we have learned with this virus puts people at higher risk. And so they, um, these are prevalent in that population as well. But the point that she makes in her article is that this was predictable was predictable. These were not issues that came with the virus. These are issues that have been in this group historically. And we know when we look at the ways, uh, the disproportionate infection in this group um, is, is the result of years of socioeconomic and, and housing vulnerability. We know this. Um, but doesn't that story sound familiar? Because in fact, some of that stories is our story in the Hawaiian community and in the Filipino communities. And again, the Filipino groups are at risk as well. I'll be honest, when we were hounding the Department of Health for data to just get a picture of where Native Hawaiians were, and this was a group organized by Office of Hawaiian Affairs, you know, when the data finally came out, we were kind of surprised that Native Hawaiians were not as severe as we expected it to be. But I don't want to rest on that because maybe we dodged some bullets. Uh, but we know and we're seeing the evidence and the trends in other countries and other communities that as we become more complacent and have become more lax in the preventive me measures, as Pauline pointed out, we're seeing more cases come up. So we have to be diligent about what we know the right thing is to do. Um, I want to um, also talk about the fact that when we think about Pacific Islander groups in Hawaii, especially the COFA or Compact of Free Association, um, Pacific Islanders, those whose governments have government-to-government -government relationships with the U.S. We have to honestly admit that there's so much discrimination against these groups. You know, there have been studies out of KKB, Dr. Megan Inada, Dr. Seiji Yamada, and the reason they've looked at discrimination is because they know it affects their health-seeking behaviors and their health care and the fact that they were discontinued to benefit from Medicaid, Medicare services uh, nationwide um, is also an indicator of how vulnerable this group is. Now, there have been states that are doing something more creative and Oregon has reinstated those benefits for 
of Pacific Islanders in Oregon. The other thing um, I wanted to is just sort of flip the lens a little bit because I always pay attention to Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander issues in health, but because I had been flagged early by the West Coast, they also kept me apprised of what they were doing. And I need to tell you that they just were on it. So by early March, they had already organized a uh, National Pacific Islander COVID group, a response group. They had already identified groups who would do translations. They put out PSAs, they put out flyers. They started negotiating with churches and public spaces for what they anticipated the need for isolation would be because of the large families. They wrote to their governors. They asked for data. They um, talked about fair, fair representation so that their voices could be at the table for the problem solving pieces of it. And uh, I'll be honest, uh, uh, my contact there was Dr. Ray Samoa, who's a local boy from Kalihi, but he's an endocrinologist at City of Hope in LA and one of the leads in their response group there. I was so impressed with what they were doing across states, Utah, Washington, Arkansas, Iowa, uh, Los Angeles, different counties. And they were so gracious in sharing their letters, their curricula, their uh, public education materials, which I forwarded on. And I just, I thought, why are they moving so fast? And we're moving so slow in our state. Part of, I think, the rationale is that this is how they have to operate anyway. Resources are limited. They have to rely on each other. They have to convene and gather when, when crises come up. And they probably face a lot more medical and health crises than we do here. Those are the Pacific Islanders on the continent. A lot of the Pacific Islanders here come specifically or directly from their countries of origin, from the Federated States of Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, uh, Palau, Pohnpei. But our largest groups here are largely Chukis and Marshallese. And, you know, we talk about how epidemics and these medical crises are part of our history. It's nothing new for Hawaiians. They, it is also not only nothing new for people in the U.S. Associated Pacific, but it's still going on. So they are dealing with the infectious diseases that, you know, have become part of our history, like cholera and smallpox and dengue fever. And for them, this is still current issues. Plus, they're dealing with the chronic diseases that come with poor diets and lack of exercise and the things that we're dealing with, cancer, heart disease. So they've got a double dose. And many come here for health care, that's true. But when I talk about discrimination, you know, I hear the narrative around town as a health educator about uh, they don't take care of their own health and, you know, they're just, you know, siphoning off our health care system and all of the above, and they don't care about their health. Otherwise, they, you know, pull up their bootstraps and get things done. And I remember as a little girl, that's what they said about us. That's what they said about Native Hawaiians. They want to be on welfare. They're lazy. They don't take care of their health. And I clearly found out that that was never true or ever true. Never met somebody who wanted to be on welfare, you know, wanted to be, you know, just tough it out and not take, not get help when their kids are sick. And so, I, I, it's sad for me to hear that narrative. And I do try to remind my fellow Hawaiians, don't forget now, 25 years, that's what they said about us. So one I think is we're in the position to be more empathetic, more helpful. Um, as we look at the things that our Hawaiian communities are needing, and we are gonna need more areas for isolation as cases rise. We are gonna need more help with food insecurity or the food deserts that are in our community. The situation is the same for Pacific Islanders in Hawaii. Um, but keep in mind that they do not have the health care network and safety net that many of us have, not just through insurance, but through Medicaid and Medicare. Those are cut off. And so if we think, well, too bad, so sad for them, think about it when they're in our emergency rooms for dialysis, for cancer. Um, we all bear that burden. 
The other thing is, I think many people in Hawaii just don't understand who they are, where they're from, and why they're here in Hawaii. And, and we talk about the COFA migrants, but people know what COFA stands for. Do we know the legislation and the politics and the history behind that? These are countries that were highly colonized before, before the U.S. got there. You know, we came in after the war and, and took over the trust territories. But make no mistake, our agenda was militaristic. We utilized these areas for military purposes. And those of you who know, uh, over 67 atomic bombs were tested after World War II in the Marshall Islands. And we still don't know what the total impact on the Pacific region was with the travel of the contaminants and radiation. But we do know that it left a horrible, saddest legacy of cancer. And, and so many are here for health care because the U.S. as overseeing trust territory said, we will take care of your health education and welfare. But we did a poor job. We did a poor job of that. But part of the Compact of Free Association allows travel between Micronesia and the US. So many come here for health care, for education. Other cities um, in the continental US, Arkansas, California, many went for not so much health care, but they went for economic opportunity. So we see that there are many Micronesians in different parts of the U.S. But we, I think, as Hawaiians have the capacity and I'd like to believe it's in our DNA for empathy and compassion because we are island people and we share the same values. We share the, shape, we share the same values of being collectivistic and we gather, that's what we do, that's how we share, that's how we learn, that's how we transmit information. They are not different. So it's really hard when we say, now you have to distance, but we've done it before and they have too. So in the Marshall Islands right now, they are not letting anybody back in country because they have no COVID cases. And um, I learned today, and I'm gonna introduce you to someone, but I learned today that there, while this is not hard statistics, there's about what, 200? 200 Marshallese here that are stuck. They're stuck here because they can't go back home. And one of those people who are stuck to my, to my uh, great enjoyment is a uh, uh, niece, um, Beverly Johnson, who is from the Marshall Islands, who's going to school in uh, Vermont. Uh, it's time to go home, but could not return home. So she came here. And one of the things I asked um, is the question you asked me, how do we as Hawaiians support the Pacific Islanders. But the question I always tell people we want to help, because you know a lot of people have tried to help us, is what help do you want? What's appropriate for you? And am I the person to help you? Or am I just the person who gets the grant to help you? But am I the correct or appropriate person to help you? So I did pose that question to Beverly, so I'm going to have her scoot over and share the screen with me. This is Beverly. Right. Hey, aloha. Thanks for joining <laughs> us. Thank you. So the question I asked Beverly, I said, what could we be doing for Pacific Islanders who may be stuck here that can't go home? And we did learn that they're thinking about opening that back up, right, Ben? Yeah. yeah so go ahead. Yeah. So there, it's not that people don't want people marshal research to go back home, but it's because we know that we are a vulnerable community out there. We have all these underlying conditions. So how can we, how can, um, how are we trying to reach out and raise awareness amongst our Pacific Island, amongst the communities of our Pacific um, Island cousins? You know, how are we reaching them and raising awareness, educating? Because, like it has been said, there, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of people that just have no idea about the the virus, and for many people, they don't believe it until it happens to them, or it becomes a personal matter that it's you know, a, a family member or someone um, is affected by it. So yeah, like just how are we gonna reach out and raise awareness? Yeah. She also shared that, you know, while they're talking about letting people come back into country, that 90% of the Marshallese back in the Marshall Islands don't want people to return. Yeah. And if you had been in that area, the, the medical, medical supplies, medical capacity is very, very limited. So they know that this would be devastating 
for their population. But I want to just make one point before I end is that we need to be cognizant and open-minded that different people view diseases differently. So while I worked in the Pacific for many years in education, diabetes, and cancer, you know, how they view diseases, what causes it, what cures it, is very different than what other people believe. Uh, you know, they said, well, diabetes is a curse, the curse from God. You know, I'm like, well, as a health educator, I'm not sure how, what to do with that. But they actually had the answers. It was a matter of having their voices at the table. The other is cures. And I think it's really relevant to us because we are a strong advocate for traditional Hawaiian medicines. We know from our kupuna and our grandmas and grandpas what worked and what didn't and what leaves we went to pick. Well, they have a whole lexicon of, of treatments and traditional medicines as well. But unless they have voice about what might work, and then also as we've learned with Hawaiian medicine, what won't work with the new diseases, I think we have to be open-minded and always make space at the table for them to, you know, do their own voices and support them in being there. Thank you, Beverly, for joining us. And thanks, Joanne, for, <laughs> for all of that wonderful information. And reminding yeah, us that... Uh, she stuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> reminding us to remember all the different perspectives. It's really a kako thing. You know, it's not just about Hawaiian people. Yeah. It's about everybody. Um, in relation to that, I'd like to go to Hardy, if you would. I understand uh, Joanne spilt that you were... Uh, releasing a publication soon. Yeah, I'm not sure about so, that. She's a co-author of it, so uh, I, uh, um, I just so on wanted... this show on this show we've we've featured a lot of Kumu and Loea, a lot of cultural practitioners and we've honored and celebrated them. And it'd be really interesting to see a little bit of how Laau Lapa'au fits into our Hawaiian history. Um, so if you would, wouldn't mind sharing a little bit of whatever you'd like to share about that subject. Oh, I'm not really the right person. You need to talk to the healers themselves. But <clears throat> um, let me just give an observation. Um, as I said, when I started a thousand years plus, uh, our uh, Kumu, our elders took care of the population here. And there was really a, a healthy population when the Europeans arrived. Uh, I think uh, from all from all evidence from, <clears throat> from the folks who study EV and stuff, they say that uh, the diseases were very few, perhaps some bacterial infections, uh, perhaps uh, yaws, uh, but <clears throat> other than very, these very few, um, there was not the large, uh, that we know of, the large epidemics that then swept through the, the nation uh, in the 19th century. But the healers themselves um, always, always uh, maintained uh, the traditions. Uh, even though we don't necessarily hear much about them once the missionaries come, except maybe the negative things from the missionary writings. If, <clears throat> as um, uh, Khalil mentioned, the the uh, newspapers. If you look in those newspapers, there are a number of articles, numerous articles, really, uh, from the healers talking about their lives and uh, different uh, recipes, actually, in some cases. Um, you know, uh, again, I need to probably fast forward uh, to the 1970s and 80s when there started to be a new interest in traditional healing. Up until that time, people knew about uh, the traditional healers and on occasion uh, they would uh, take advantage of them. I have a, a dear friend, a family who, uh, uh, and I think I can share this, uh, uh, the <clears throat> family had a son that was going to St. Louis High School. Uh, he was a football player and uh, in one particular game, he injured his leg. And it was diagnosed as a broken leg. His father took him to a healer on the other side of the island. And as it was related to me, through an evening and a day of La'au Kahea and uh, various poultices and sometimes extreme pain, in 24 hours, the leg was fine. The fellow went back and played the next game. And I was told, 
meet Punahou. <laughs> so uh, at any rate, there are these instances where the healers come forth and uh, we know that their various uh, thoughts um, really provided uh, the essence of health care. Uh, and as they will tell you, 80% of it is spirituality. Um, I need to also credit uh, Papa Owai, who sort of brought this back into uh, visibility, shall we say, with a number of others who joined him. Um, uh, Kalua, uh, Kaiohua, um, and of course, um, uh, Kahu Kealakea, and uh, we have a number of others. But um, <clears throat> at any rate, uh, traditional healing has become once again uh, very much uh, involved in, in a number of people's lives. Um, we're fortunate that we have a number of students from these original elders from the 70s that continue the practice um, and practices. Um, I don't know what more to say except we're really blessed in Hawaii to have those traditions continue. You know, uh, we, have to, we have to remember that our king uh, gave forth with Halinawa a safe place for those uh, protections uh, to be shared uh, in, in necessary, not in secret, but uh, in confidentiality. Uh, on the third floor of the palace was the meeting room where his Halinawa met uh, periodically to, um, to discuss these items of vast importance. Um, I think what, what I'd like to simply say is, um, well, a couple of things. First of all, Joanne is, is very modest. And, and one of the things that in her prior life at Ime Hali, that they, when they were working on cancer and diabetes, primarily in the Pacific Islands, they did a lessons learned um, and I think it would be wise if anyone's doing any work on Pacific Islanders to go back and look at those lessons learned because it talks about how do you, how do you address Pacific Island health? Whether we're talking about disease care, which we are actually, we're not talking about health care, we're talking about disease care. Uh, health care is uh, the preventive side of, of what we, we need to discuss. Um, the second thing is that we are just in a, in a training period. There's going to be a second wave, and we need to be prepared for that as, a, uh, as individuals, as community, as an island-wide, and as a uh, lahui uh, of our islands themselves. So I would hope if our lieutenant governor is listening out there, um, that he starts looking at what is the infrastructure that needs to be fine-tuned, that we're learning now uh, how basically it works in our communities. That infrastructure needs to be fine-tuned for the second wave. You know, that 1918, 1920 epidemic, it was the second wave where most of the people sadly passed away. Um, not only the public health infrastructure for our government, but the schools that Kaleo's working on, what will be the, the structure to handle that situation? What will be the community's response? How can we prepare our communities for that second wave? Get, you know, we know what we need to do. Uh, that's clear. We have to quarantine to a certain degree. We have to wear masks. We need to um, cut down on our um, interfacing with individuals. Uh, the, the formula has been clear from our queen in 1881. It's just that how do we fine tune that? How do we sustain it? And then, quite frankly, when there is a vaccine, will everyone accept it? That I'm hearing more and more that uh, this is going to be an issue. Uh, it already is, I guess, a political issue about who's going to get the vaccine. But I think a secondary question is, is it going to be accepted by individuals? So <clears throat> we want to make sure it's safe. So how do we start that discussion in our communities, um, in our families? It starts with the family discussion. 
moves out to the community. And then, of course, the, the larger islands uh, from uh, uh, Keawe to Lehua. Um, how do we start those discussions and keep them there? You know, it's interesting. If I had been asked about the 1918 flu influenza that came through here in those years, I would have said, what? I had never heard of that. You know, um, and it was simply a, a course at the UH in uh, public health that made me aware of that. And so I had an opportunity to go interview an, an individual who had lost his grandparents in that uh, flu uh, epidemic. We don't t teach these things. People forget. It's so interesting how fast and what a generation retains in terms of its history. And I think, Khalil, you started talking about the Mokuaho. Um, you know, every child should have an opportunity to sit down with their parents. Now, I know there's some, <laughs> some uh, situations that are sort of touchy, but they still should have that basic Mokuaho information. And the epidemics, the ability to succeed, the ability to survive, to sustain oneself needs to be a part of that discussion. Well, I mahalo. Mahalo. Thank you <laughs> mahalo <very much. laughs> um, so getting back to education, um, a big concern, of course, in our community, our parents worried about their keiki. But um, I would argue that uh, another pressing matter would be how are we protecting our kumu? Um, Kaleo, can you speak a little bit about um, about that topic? Oh, sorry, you muted. You got to unmute. Sorry. I wanted to thank Anakala Hardy, okay. Mahalo Nui, and I wanted to share this wonderful slide with him because he brought up something that's very dear to my heart, and that is to show Keiki how um, the kahuna, la au la pa au, were very much embraced by our people. And that all the way up until 1905, the kahuna la au la pa au practitioners, they were actually actively engaged in the community and supported by the community. And that Wait, did you share the screen yet? Oh, did I not share? I don't see anything yet. Try again. Okay, sorry. I thought I shared it. Here we go. One more time. Yeah. How's that? Can you see it? There, yeah, there you okay. go. And I just wanted to applaud his efforts to make sure that this manao is shared throughout. That the kahuna la'au lapa'au not only shared a space and a place and a voice, but they also were certified. And that part really touches me when I bring that to my haumana because, you know, growing up, grandma getting, you know, the lemon from the roof. And then uncle trying to bring to the house, you know, the leaf from the noni tree and putting it on the stove and then putting it on top of you and trying to get a piva done or something else. You know, that was just basic practices in your house. But um, little did we know that was that was certified la'au lapa'au medicine. And um, I wanted to thank him for bringing that to the space. To answer your question, I'm going to use myself as an example. And thank you, yeah. Kale, for bringing it up. Okay, so here we go. I know everybody's basic burning question is, Kaleo, what's happening in the schools? I only can give you a bird's eye view, so give me a minute or two so that I can share this with you. First of all, consider this. We have now been activated to not go to school until September 14th. However, we were planning to go face-to-face -face starting Monday. That was the first initial um, extension of the rule. So this is the subjects of the high school, right, lined up. So if you had like a art, history, um, band, uh, uh, what is this, home economics, and what have you. Now this is my day. These are my students. So on a basic week, I will see my students, approximately 150 students, two times, um, two times a day, right? And so I would see them twice in that week. So I would have 300 contacts in one week. Right. That's basic for me. Now let's move on to kids. 
you're going to send your kids, your grandchildren, your children, your nieces and your nephews to me, right? What does that look like? So 16 students is approximate per classroom with the social distancing, right? They got to go to five, maybe six classes. So we're going to round it off to five classes. They have to attend it twice a day. And when you look at the number of contacts, it's 160 contacts per week. So if your Ohana bubble is like mine, which right now it consists of me and my husband, I am now not only considered to be frontline, at risk, and um, definitely very vulnerable. Look, I'm taking my family from two to 300%. That's not counting, listen to this, the bus driver if I'm catching the bus. Any other teachers I come into contact, any other um, workers at the school. And then, of course, I have to do some shopping, so maybe I'll go to the store once a week. My contacts are now moving from 300 to maybe 320. That's a, that's a teacher. But then really, I want to really emphasize, if you are in a household with more than one keiki, this is the keiki times whatever keiki you have in your house of the number of contacts coming into your house. And that's not to say that our keiki are not interacting when they cross each other in the pathway, right? I'm walking, I'm going to the bathroom, four people in the bathroom. Not every place and every corner of the school is monitored. I also want to go back to what was brought up earlier about asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic. A couple things we need to keep in mind when we're talking about that. And this is where um, the public is really needs to know this because your keiki are being exposed. I want to talk about the teachers, but you know, teachers, we're in this um, loving profession for our keiki. Returning to school means the increasing contact of almost 200%. Why? Currently, um, your Ohana bubbles right now consist of your families. So if you're looking at the pre-symptomatic uh, pre people, population is about 20%, and eventually this group is of uh, infected individuals will show symptoms within 5 to 10 days and are already shedding virus. They're already shedding virus uh, through coughing, sneezing, touching surfaces, water droplets, aerosolized uh, mucus uh, molecules, right? Now, if you are asymptomatic, that's almost 40% of our population or so. And they are shedding a virus just like pre-symptomatic uh, people. But these individuals, this is the catcher now. These people will not show any symptoms. And coming through the airports and, the, and other areas, these individuals will also not be detected on those temperature gauges, okay? So all of these things that we do have in place are not going to safeguard even the littlest of our keiki. So even if a teacher does have a thermometer, they could be asymptomatic. Now, there's one more thing that I wanted, a couple more things I wanted to share. What can teachers do? What are we doing? We're using Bitmoji and Flipgrid and... Uh, what else? Padlet. And what are we trying to do? Creatively draw and engage our youth to become peer educators. So literally, they know how to use the computer better than you and I. And if we give them a bedazzled page, and we try and put in this bedazzled page, you know, places and spaces and spaces that really meet with them, like, heva'a hemoku, hemoku heva'a. We're all in this together, right? Things like a uh, Kupa'a Collective. It can open, they open it up, they have resources they can share with mom and dad, grandma and grandpa. Stay safe tips and keep children safe. Who wouldn't want to open that? But also these things, like most children would have heard about the virus, so people, share it with them how to wear a mask. Keep open communication with your keiki. Yeah? Don't just shut them down. Don't shut them off. If they want to talk, mom, dad, you know, today we went to school and I think one of the boys was really crying and he was scared. Let your children talk to you. Let them voice their opinions about what they're experiencing and then seek the help and guidance that you need. Some of the other tips is about ourselves as, as, as teachers, as kumu, as parents, as kupuna. When you notice yourself feeling anxious, take time to calm down before you're trying to have any conversation with anybody. Take a couple breaths and then just realize we're all in this together and then come together as a family.
I, I really impress upon all of you parents out there, if your kumu is sending you something like this, sit down, get your clock out, put 30 minutes on the clock and take the time to go over the information. You know, people like Hardy, people like Joanna, they're working really nonstop to put this kind of information out. And we teachers are really looking for it. We are engaging this, we are putting this into our spaces. We are making sure that our haumana have this information and it is fun and it's bedazzled so that they also become the peer educator in their home. And like Pauline said, they start to speak in their language, in their tongue. They start to calmly project their feelings of aloha and compassion to their kupuna. And then they start to pick and rise their lahui through their ohana themselves. They are engaged and they are empowered. And that is when we see the onipa'akako that Lili wanted for all of us, all of the people, not only just kanaka Hawaii, yeah, pa'aina Hawaii. You know, when she made those comments of kupa'a and onipa'a, it was about all of the lahui in Hawaii. She made sure that in the pilina as a leader, that she not only connected with us at the kanaka level, she was very spiritually enlightened. But at the aina level, she also wanted us to know that she was going to safeguard us and this aina. And that's what we need to do too as kumu, as well as a collective, yeah, as a kanaka collective. Um, one more thing I wanted to share. We as a kanaka group, ohana, kupuna, nahui, we need to come up with other visuals to engage kanaka keiki. Yeah, if I give this to my haumana, I want them to change it. I want them to flip it. I want them to put their own take on how we would do six feet distancing. You know, maybe it's a hula step. Maybe it's in another language. Maybe it's their own faces. But creatively launch to our keiki positive messages that embrace the wearing of masks, that embrace a culture, this new culture of telling people nicely, mahalo for waiting for me so I could go down the island with my wagon at Walmart. Mahalo nui in my language, salamat po, right? Because that kanaka at the other end is not only protecting him, but he's protecting me. So messaging this in a culture that is not only loving and aloha that comes from anti pilahi paki, but also sends this value that we love you, we care about you, we want you and your families to feel this aina, this aloha, this pilina. So um, to answer your question, these are the last four of my slides that are part of my, my um, syllabus. This is in my syllabus. My students have it right now. Their parents have to sit for 30 minutes. This is not all of my syllabus, but every piece of my syllabus is a part of a living document that they can go back to and that they can go and enrich their lives with. It's not just something flat. And I, I want to impress upon all of the kumu that are here that try very hard right now in this time to offer our keiki more. They deserve more from us. We've lived this, like Uncle Hardy has said. We know we are resilient. Let's actually culture that into our practice. Let's activate that into our practice. And let's embrace our keiki because they've been out of touch since March. What community does that to their keiki? Not us. We don't do that to our keiki. So this is a really great push on behalf of the, the kumu out there. I totally love you. I feel for you. I know that you've put your heart and soul into this work. Some of you blood, sweat, and tears. Right now, I'm sure you're probably dropping some tears as you listen to me. They have not slept a wink. They have actually sacrificed their own time with their families so that they can roll out great plans like this. But most importantly, and this is something that I really want everyone on this um, platform to see, is every single kumu is reaching with the voices of our loea kupuna. We're not using only our own voices. That's what the DOE wants. They want us to shine with our voices, but we have been trained by all of our kumu to commit to using the loea knowledge from Uncle Hardy and from people like Pilahi Paki, Auntie Pua Kanahele, uh, Kanaka Ole, and also others that I've mentioned. So thank you for this opportunity. I know that I spoke a lot. I hope I answered your questions. 
Thank you so much, Khalil. Um, we're almost to the end of our time. I'm going to give each of you uh, a few minutes to, or a few moments to give some closing thoughts, whether it be scoldings or encouragement to our Hawaiian community. But before we do that, I just want to lighten the mood for a little bit. It seems we can't have a discussion about the health of our Hawaiian community without a certain name that has become synonymous, Kekuni Blaisdell. Can, this is open to all of our panelists. Can you speak on, there's many in our community that have no idea who this person is. Can you speak of how important he is to our conversation today and to our Lahui at large? Let me just say I was fortunate enough to have worked with him for many years. Every time we honey, touch nose to nose. That's Kekuni. Every time we Oli, particularly in the beginning of a meeting, a gathering, that's Kekuni. Whenever we have a discussion about the relationship of our kupuna and our students today, our haumana, particularly those at the medical school, that's Kekuni. He was one of those individuals whenever we honor Kawikeo Uli on Restoration Day at uh, Thomas Square, that's Kekuni. So he was a man of, of, of many, many uh, mana'o. And he gave us, uh, I think we are all who had the wonderful ability to share our lives with him, um, the, the feeling that how fortunate we all were to have passed in this world uh, on, together and having the opportunity to know and be with one another. And uh, someone who I will always uh, hold dear in my heart. Mahalo. Anyone else wanna to add to that? Sure, this is Joanne. You know, I like oh. Cardi, I, I was so blessed to have had so much time with uh, Kekuni, he really kind of, uh, as he did with many, took me under his wing as a young health educator. And first he thanked me for being pregnant and increasing the lahui. And then um, <laughs> he, uh, he set me on a path um, to take on cancer and chronic diseases, which I never felt adequate to do. But you know, his, he was always really, if not you, why not you, you know? Um, but one of the things, uh, and we just talked about Kekuni recently, is that Kekuni was inclusive. He was inclusive of everyone. Um, and he just had that just delightful ability to, to find the strengths you, in you that you didn't even know you had. And he set the bar high. You know, and you wanted to reach it because you wanted to please him and you wanted to do well. He really, I think for myself and others around me, he helped us understand our accountability and kuleana for what we had to do. Why did you went to school? Why not? You, you would do this. And um, the other thing is he documented my life in photographs because if anybody knew Kikuni, he took a photo of every group that uh, he was in, whether it was just a meeting or, you know, gathering or something. So I have 30 years of pictures. Um, wow. But the other thing which I, I aspire to be, I am so flunking, but he was not petty. He was um, very optimistic. He wasn't a pushover, but he was very optimistic. And I think he had a vision and you know, I like people with visions because I'm a good follower, but I'm not the visionary. Uh, visionaries are hard to find. And so he just had a vision and we all had a place in it. And so it was such an honor to, to know him. And he was a funny guy too. So, you know, I mean, um, and, and an excellent educator. So we can thank our, our cadre of Kalka 
because of his tutelage and his mentoring um, for that. Mahalo, Joanne. Khalil or Pauline, anything to add? Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, you know, as a young student coming into the University of Hawaii between 84 and 1988, I'm sorry I'm dating myself, but the reason why those are glorified years for me is uh, there is um, Kua Ana and Operation Manong at the time. And I remember we didn't have, I, I just kind of got into the situation and he was like, I'm going to walk over to Operation Manong and see if they have any um, tuition waivers for the rest of us haumana that are olelo Hawaii over here, I'm Hawaiian, and I'm going to walk over there. You guys want to join me? And we're all looking at him, and he's just like, come on, let's go. And he grabs his stick and put on his hat and just trotted down there and then came back up, and here was four tuition waivers. And some of us belong to Operation Manong, and we, all, we actually belong to Kua'ana at the same time which was really a wonderful opportunity for me when I entered into the college at that time. And he, from that moment on, it was like this big interest in what I was doing. One day he walked in, he says, I'm going to Waukele Opuna. How many of you are joining me? And I would be, we would all look at him, he goes, come on, let's all go. And that was the way he did it. I'm going to make Kapa Kau Kau and we're going to meet up at Queen Lili'u. And we're all on our max trying desperately to work because there was only one and a tiny little screen. And he's like, how many of you want to go to Lili'u um, Children's Center? Come on, let's go. And it was kind of like this really inviting mechanism of gathering people. And as we walked down more hall, more and more Haumana would follow. It was like little ducklings. And I wanted to just mention that even when we were at Queen Lili'u Okalani and he put us in the room, he made us sit at the table with the likes of Haunani, with the likes of um, Polika Pudenmen, Auntie Pele. I mean, these, were, these are kupuna of ah, to Haumana like us. And she, no, you're sitting on the table. And we're really like, that's okay, Anakala, we will, you know, no, 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 you're sitting on the table, like really wanting us to feel that table and really get the grip to it and say, okay, I have a space on this table and there's no empty seats. So you would say there's no empty seats. But one more last endearing, and I'm so sorry this is going on. No, I love no, how no. Joanne said, Ho'o'ulu lahui. Everywhere we were on campus, he would just, Ho'o'ulu lahui, Ho'o'ulu lahui. <laughs> And I would walk up to him and he would say, as a Hawaiian, what is your first and most important requirement? And I would say, and he would say, yes, you have an A. Yay. And he just keep that momentum for us when we were there. And I felt so special. I felt so loved. I felt I was part of a larger picture at the University of Hawaii, knowing full well I was only 1% but he made me feel like I was 100%. And that is the kekuni I adore and I love. And I always refer back to his wonderful spirit of, of um, Ho'ulu Lahu. Mahalo for sharing, Kaleo. Anything to add, Pauline? I only, I only spoke to him once because I come from a different part of the university but I can nice. speak about how important bridge people are. So I'm going to speak about Dr. Isabella Abbott and yes, how please. she was able to bridge Hawaiian language and science and the role of Hawaiian mentors and, and visionaries. And in her case, in the last year of her life, the last five months of her life, she sat me down with Puakea and pointed to those 4,000 articles that had they were not translated but they were now in a database and they had to do with um storms and weather etc and that had started as a tiny bridge between jimar joint institute of uh, ocean and air marine atmospheric research and hawaiian language and she said okay it is there what are you going to do with it and because she said to do these things, she, you, people never really tell you exactly what to do, but they show you that there is an opportunity. 
And beginning with that, I wrote my first NSF proposal that put Hawaiian language, and, I, and to be honest, I don't speak, but I know how important it is. And as a public school student, I know how much was left out of my own learning. So that was the start of a decade of National Science Foundation grants that have expanded the role of Hawaiian translations in research and education and, and have increased the number of people that are interested in developing curriculum that brings together these formerly non-trusting domains of knowledge so that I can thank the elders who had that vision and for all the issues that they experienced, now I understand how incredibly difficult it was to be Native Hawaiian in Hawaii in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. The incredible struggle that they still had the strength and the clarity of vision to see a better future and to move people onto that path. So I have to thank these important visionary leaders. Mahalo, Pauline. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Um, we've, I think we've done a great job in this two-hour setting to kind of create all these different webs of connections from the past 200 years of health crises to what we're dealing with today. Um, in just a minute or two each, could each of you give a closing statement to our Hawaiian community? Joanne, we'll start with you. Um. I guess I'd like to continue to close it um, thinking about Kekuni. One of the charges he gave me as a young health educator when we were lobbying to pass the Native Hawaiian Health Care Act, he said, get to the table, get to the table. So it was nice to hear Kalei's story about him making room at the table. It was a charge. I felt that it was a direct charge to me and others to get to the table. And the one thing, the way he demonstrated it, um, is even though he was all of our mentors, is he was the most curious learner. So I traveled with Kikuni a lot, but no matter where we went, it was like, why do you think this? How come they do that? What's the significance of this place? And he constantly questioned and it was, it, it was so, you know, in passing, just learn more about our Pacific Islander guests in, in, in Hawaii. Um, they not just helped us reawaken uh, navigation, but they have so much more to tell and learn and teach us as well. Thank you. Mahalo, Joanne. I'll go back to Pauline. Any closing thoughts? Oh, sorry, you're still muted. Sorry. Dr. Abbott told us to talk to our elders, to bring forth the stories of our elders. And she gave us a chapter title to one of our, her last and indefinitely uh, our collaborative writings, Ua Lele Kamanu. And she said that what it was, something might be lost and you're looking all over for it, but it is there to be found. And she said, that is what you need to do. And that was a title that we turned into an English title. It's the search for Hawaiian inquiry. And so she has led us into the path of Hawaiian science, Hawaiian inquiry, and going back to the elders. So that's my driving force with the many now, many doctoral students, master's students, teachers who honor the past and bring into their curriculum and into the teaching the voices of, their, of the ancestors and the people of the place. Mahalo Nui, thank you so much, Pauline. Hardy, what do you have to say to our Oh boy, listen. Uh... Just to have shared these two hours with all of you, well, mahalo and kaleo, wonderful work you folks are doing uh, out at yes. uh, Laie. 
uh, and Pauline, the work you're doing with the grants, uh, let's keep our fingers crossed and get those dollars here. It's always wonderful to see Joanne uh, and uh, your uh, niece over there. Uh, good, good that you're here. Uh, and best to your parents too. Um, and um, Kale, uh, the work that you folks do at Ahakane is is just so refreshing to see how the organization has continued to thrive and develop. And with your leadership on these uh, video zooms, uh, sorry I couldn't get my <laughs> my zoom working. To, gotta call on the grandchildren. Yeah, you get them all puna here, and uh, they'll figure it out. But um, I guess just a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is Kulia uh, Ikanu, you know, the, the Olelo Noyao of our uh, queen, uh, Kapi'olani, uh, strive for the highest. Let's uh, make that uh, something that we focus on our children. Let's make sure, and us also as individuals, but our children need to strive for the highest, be the best that they can be. Uh, and <clears throat> The legacy of the queen, I think, is too often overlooked. But that, in in that nutshell, she captures where we need to be as an island people. And of course, our last queen, Onipa'a. Let's be strong, be firm. We've been here before with different epidemics and different influences. COVID-19 will come and go, and there will be probably many, many more that we and don't know about now, but with the world being what it is, they will come as well. We must be prepared, but as our queen said, Onipa'a. So mahalo everyone, aloha. Hi, Onipa'a, mahalo Hardy. Kaleo. Aloha mai kako. I just wanna make sure that, you know, in my last words, it's just messaging. Really um, asking our administrators out there, um, our, our leaders to message the right information to our KP. Number one, you know, Halau Kumana put this out, said that, you know, travel right now is not a good idea. If we can really like stay home and stay put, make sure to take care of our KP, open schools, that means we stay home, no travel. Number two, flu season is coming people. Let's get ready for it. Protect yourself and our kupuna especially. Number three, families and Ohana must model correct use of mask wearing everywhere we go and be proud of it. Together as a family mask up. Families can influence. Number four, systematic change by teaching children about importance of protecting their Ohana bubble. Turn it into a family activity. Turn it into something joyful and an occasion where families come together and they say, thank you for protecting me. Yeah, your kupuna. Thank you for protecting me. Role play, dialogue. Hey, Tutu is wearing her mask, so our Kiki will wear their mask too. Have dialogue with them. Commercials using screen, screen testify, flip grid, whatever the kids need, but let them have their voice be heard. Original pieces of art information right now that sends messages of aloha, that is the ticket for saving our lahuri. When a keiki comes on my Instagram and they're telling me, Auntie, you look good with your mask on, Auntie. I'm going to wear my mask for that keiki. And finally, document, document, document your mo'olelo because somebody's going to want to publish you. Our people need to be published. The more we get our keiki published, we get each other's mo'olelo and story published, we continue that legacy of literacy that Kawikea Uli started for us. And that is the mission for this time. So that is my closing message to all of our Lahuni. I love you all dearly. I am with you all 100%. We are not at this alone. We are all together. He va'a, he moku, he moku, he va'a. Aloha. Mahalo nui kaleo. Wow, what a wonderful kuka kuka session to encourage our lahui that we'll, we'll make it through this. Thank you so much to Kaleo, Joanne, Pauline, Hardy, uh, wonderful panelists for today. Mahalo nui to each, each of you for taking the time to spend with, with us today, mahalo. I'm gonna give a couple announcements to uh, close off our episode for today. Be sure to tune in to our other sure. Kanayo Kana online programs. Lea Nui Nui, Aloha Rising, Kua Kanaka, Aikole, and of course, Hehue Vaiola. 
Also, Ahakane is proud to present two brand new shows uh, which are important for our keiki at this time. One more distraction for them or one more educational opportunity. Aha Upio uh, for our teens and Aha Keiki for our little ones. Be sure to share that together as an ohana and watch those shows as well. Uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Ahakane and at Kanayokana. Mahalo nui to our sponsors that make Hehue Viola possible. Ahakane, Kanayokana, Hawaii Tourism through Kukuluola Program, Papa Ola Lokahi, and Consuelo Foundation. During this pandemic, um, this two hours was very useful and um, very encouraging for our people. But if you are in need of any resources, you need help, you're not alone out there. It is truly a kako thing. Don't forget that there are resources out there. All you need to do is reach out. And there are many available. Um, you can go back and pause this show at any time to uh, check out this, these last couple of pages of resources for, um, for your family, for your health, uh, especially uh, during these COVID-19 times. Um, otherwise, uh, we invite you to take a survey uh, to help us improve every week. We've had 16 weeks of wonderful shows, and we want to keep going. So uh, let us know what you like, what you don't like, how we can improve, how we can better serve you as a Lahui. Otherwise, um, again, join us every Friday, uh, 2 p.m. on Fridays on Kanaokana's Facebook page or website. Thank you so much to our panelists again. Thank you to our viewers out there for watching us. We will be back next week at 2 p.m. Thank you for joining us. Mahalo nui and aloha.